really good, esteemed panel to kick things off today. We're going to start by welcoming to the stage Melody Arabo. Did I say it right? Melody Arabo. Specialist for edreports.org. She was a teacher and ambassador <laughs> fellow at the U.S. Department of Ed and 2015 Michigan Teacher of the Year. <laughs> now, Dave, you gotta help me with your last name. Midor. Dave Midor. Now, he has done so much in the city and state. I, I'm, I'm just gonna take a sliver of his. <laughs> Uh, bio and for today's purposes, he's vice chair and chief administrative officer for DT Energy, co-chair of Duggan's Detroit Workforce Development Board, and co-founder of Autism Alliance of Michigan. <laughs> and also welcome Kristen Totten. She's in Flint, Michigan. Um, she's an education attorney for the ACLU of Michigan, and we know the ACLU was the first to break the news to all of us about the Flint water crisis. And as, uh, as such, she represents Flint children in the federal class action suit to meet education needs of Flint kids in the wake of the Flint water crisis. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So we got a lot to talk about and some problems to solve in the next 45 minutes, yes? yes. yes. Let's do it. Um, I'm gonna start off by saying, um, it was a few years ago when I was at Mackinac and heard Katie Haycock say something that has stuck with me. I mean, just, I, I can't get it out of my mind. I don't know if she made it up, if she heard it somewhere, mm -hmm. but Katie Haycock used to run at Trust. And she said during a speech once that, and she was talking about equity. She said, the kids who need the least, I'm sorry, the kids who need the most, the kids who need the most are getting the least. The kids who need the most highly qualified teachers are getting the least. The most resources are getting the least. The most special education is getting the least. The most talented and gifted programs, they're getting the least. The kids who need the most are getting the least, and that's, at the center, as far as I can tell, of equity issues in our state and, and in our nation. Uh, what we have today, if you haven't really uh, thought about it, this is a panel of outsiders, right? We're outsiders looking in, leaning in, getting involved. Uh, so I want to kick the conversation off by asking each of you, round robin style, to talk about, um, when we talk about equity or lack of equity, Define that for us so we can frame the conversation, whether it's lack of equity in workforce development, lack of equity in, in special education, lack of equity in, in classroom resources. What are we talking about just to frame the conversation? You wanna start, Kristen? Sure. sure. Um, well, I think that that was phrased really well in regards to the kids that need the most or the least, and that is equity, right? In regards to making sure that we have a foundational allowance that really is balanced towards meeting the needs of the children not just making sure that everybody gets the same, we need to make sure that we are really investing where kids need it. And you know, I can speak specifically as to Flint, uh, my heart breaks in regards to the um, gifted and talented program that they've had to shut down because they don't have the resources. Now there are a lot of gifted and talented children within Flint, and they're not gonna be able to realize their full potential because of this new change. So that's something that we need to make sure is not happening because we are wasting the most vital resource that we have, which is our children that could really help um, help us with all of the problems that we're about to face or are currently facing. Well, I, I just uh, want to start by, when we talk about this, it, 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 by its nature, it sounds very negative. Uh, but, you know, I, I really like an author, Jim Collins, who wrote the book, The, the Great and Great by Choice, because he talks about this concept that if you have aspirations and you want to get from where you are to where you want to be, you have to, you have to face your brutal reality. And in talking about the brutal reality, sometimes it sounds really, really negative, and it also sounds like we're pointing fingers, including at teachers, but that's not what I'm, I, I and others, I believe, are doing. But we also have to stand back and say something's really, really wrong here. And if we don't come together as a community, it's not going to change. So for me, um, equity, um, I look at things like on the Mayor's Workforce Development Board, uh, half the adults in the city of Detroit are not participating in the workforce. And if you look at that population, 
uh, average reading level is ninth grade, average uh, math level is seventh grade, half of that population are returning citizens, and so the barriers to employment are enormous. And, and you stand back and say, did education or lack of education play a role in this? And the answer is absolutely. Um, and then my other place that I go very quickly is special education. So I have a daughter on the spectrum and started the Autism Alliance in Michigan and have been experiencing this personally, but also watching what's played out in the state. And if we think that the state of Michigan is in the bottom 10% for K through 12, then we know we have you know, students in poverty, students of color, uh, students that are in special education. There are some good programs, but in many cases, uh, these are the students that are left behind because often people don't believe in them. So there was a study done, for example, by Michigan State on students with autism. Less than half of the students' IEPs even had academic goals in the IEPs at all. Uh, you know what, we, we know what IEPs are, right? Individual education plans for right. special needs students. So we have situations so an adult in the autism population, half the students are graduating with, not graduating, they're leaving school without a high school diploma. Yeah, I don't know about you all, but try to find a job at all right now without an education. And the first thing people ask is, you know, are you a high school graduate? And if you say no, I try to find work. So that leads to 90% unemployment in the, in the adults on the autism spectrum, but that's, that's common across many disabilities. And it's, we have to stand back as a society and say, is this acceptable? And the answer is no. We have to change this. Classroom teacher for so many years, Michigan Teacher of the Year, equity. What, what is, define that, frame it, so that we can at least know what we're talking about, what we're trying to solve. When I think of equity, I think of this image of three children trying to see over a wall. I saw that familiar, picture, right? right? That illustration. We're and familiar with that? Yeah. Clap yes. if you've heard, you've seen it. Yeah. That is so illustrative. In the, first, in the first iteration of that, you see three children who have different needs to be able to see over that wall. And at first, you give them all the same resources. And that's not enough for some of those kids. In the second iteration, you see a child getting more than maybe what someone else needs, and it does solve the problem. But I'm really moved by the third iteration of that illustration, which is the wall is removed. The barrier is just removed and it makes it easier for all kids to access what they're trying to get. And so that's what I picture and I think about that image all of the time. And I think what has happened in Michigan is uh, we've created more and more barriers over the last decade. There's been a lot of decisions made that have reduced funding to classrooms. Um, I know for myself personally, over 15 years, class sizes increased tremendously. Uh, we haven't had counselors in, our, in my elementary school um, in about eight or nine years. Not even one counselor for 700 students. We have a you know maybe a half-time social worker that really focuses on the students with IEP. So we have major behavior needs. We have uh, less resources. Uh, a lot of our supports have been taken away. A lot of the extra adult supports have been taken away. And so we have been creating bigger and bigger walls, and bigger and bigger barriers for our students and we're not giving educators the tools that they need to help those students see. So that's what I think of when I think of equity. I, I totally understand where, where you're coming from. My kids used to go to Troy Public Schools where kids have so, so many needs, but they're giving 7,600 per student. We moved to Birmingham schools and kids have fewer needs and they're getting 12,000 per student. That's not equity, that's not equality, but that's Michigan, right? So uh, I was watching uh, a video Melly did on Twitter <laughs> talking about this event, and you, you mentioned that you think that we're in a pivotal moment in education in Michigan. Um, and so I'm gonna start with you and come back this way. Why do you say that? And then to each of you, I would like for you to expound on whether you agree or disagree or why, but why do you think this is a pivotal moment for us here in education in Michigan right now? Well, first, I think the need is clear. I don't think there's anybody that could argue that our education system is not the right place. Do you think most people get it, though? I do. I think now, I think it's taken a long time to get there. I mean, I've been speaking up for years about how these uh, decreases in funding have been impacting um, even a, a great district like Wall Lake, who doesn't have as many, um, you know, uh, needs. And so I think that we need to get educators into the conversation. And actually, I'll say, 
I think we've come a long way in the last five years in getting educators to be part of the discussions and getting input from educators, but we do not, um, we do not make them part of the decision making. So I would love to see legislators connecting with educators regularly, even having liaisons that are directly in the classroom. I would love to see uh, educators on the new governor's transition team or any of the uh, team members that they're bringing in to discuss education, which is part of their platform and which is something that they want to address. Uh, there are just a lot of needs that I think have been ignored. Uh, special education is another one. Uh, I'm a parent of a child with an IEP as well, and I, my family has struggled tremendously with the process and with trying to get our children what they need and what we know they deserve. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of ways that we can address those, but the first thing is we need to get educators <laughs> as decision makers. Uh, we need to restore the funding so that we can bring those resources back and not equally. Because you're right, there are things um, in certain districts that they're provided with that they might not even necessarily need. And then we have our uh, high poverty districts who aren't getting nearly as much to be able to address those. Um, I think it's a pivotal time because we have new leadership. We have uh, a search for a new state superintendent. We have uh, new school board members or state board members of education. So uh, we have an interest, we have a desire, we have a need, and now we have people in place that can help to get us there. Gotcha, and, and we all know that right now, Michigan is making less progress on the nation's report card than most states, right? There were a handful of states that over the last 20 years have made zero progress. States like Tennessee and Mes uh, Mississippi, 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 <laughs> Mississippi Tennessee have passed us up. And, and test for us. We're, we're treading water around other states that are moving ahead, right? So, so Dave, why are we at a pivotal moment? Do you even agree with that, that we're, this is a pivotal moment as far as education reform in Michigan? Well, I, I do. I, uh, you know, from the business community standpoint, you know, we look at how are we going to find workers to fill jobs. So, you know, as an example right now, half of our workforce at DT will retire in the next five years, and that's not uncommon. We can't find people to fill jobs today, uh, even though you know at the same time we have these high uh, percentages of people not in the workforce in this community and other communities. Uh, so you have, you have this high number of retirements, can't find workers today. Uh, MEDC, which is the state's economic development organization, is projecting right now that we will run out of uh, people to employ by 2028. And you say, you know, how are we going to grow as a state, as an economy, and have this be a top 10 place to live and work and raise a family? So what's happening is there's forums like this where people are coming together and you're hearing this constant drumbeat where people are asking the question, how about the children? And people are now starting to learn, and I don't think everybody understands this, that we are in the bottom 10% in the United States and we're declining. Now the United States is declining compared to the world, and Michigan is on its way to being the worst in the country. And so, you know, we have other issues we have to take on. We have to deal with roads and infrastructure and water. And I get all that, but the business community is finally coming together to say, this is fundamental and it's foundational. And if we don't take this issue on and address it, as other states have, and there's hope because other states, as Amber has pointed out, they've turned around and they've turned around in a short time frame. But if we don't take this issue on, a lot of these other things that we talk about won't matter. How important is the business community in that conversation? Absolutely important. I think. Do, can we get it done without you? I mean, you guys fund campaigns. <laughs> I mean, donations to legislators who make laws, and you employ people. We're large can we get employers. this education reform done without you? I, I don't think so. I, you know, I think there's some evidence that says when the business community finally locks on something and they join uh, in a partnership with uh, elected officials and community organizations and research groups like the Education Trust, you can move mountains. And this is now becoming one of the top priorities for the CEOs in this company, in this uh, state, excuse me. Class, do we agree that the business community has to do that? Well, Claudia, the business community needs to mind on business. Oh, there you go. This is a capitalist nation, right? Uh, Kristen, uh, pivotal moment in education? 
Well, I think it's just illustrated the community is rising up. The business community is rising up. And I see community partners rising up, bringing litigation, right to literacy case, the Flint education case. We are not gonna stand by and let our children suffer anymore. I think we as a community are saying we care about our children and our voices are getting stronger, they're getting louder, and we're getting um, great traction in regards to advancing the cause of the most vulnerable children. And by rising them, raising them up, we'll raise everybody. Talk about, um, th just you know, zag for me a little. We're gonna talk about Flint, and then we're gonna talk about special education, because I'm not sure if you realize that everyone here on this panel has a lot of expertise when it comes to that. And not only are we a bottom 10 state, for reading and education in general, but we are the only state in America that the federal government identified as being in need of special intervention as far as special education. But let's start with talking about what's going on in Flint. My question is, if, if it can happen in Flint, can it happen anywhere as far as children who need a lot being ignored? Absolutely. And I think that's part of the wake-up call. Update us. What's going on with the education uh, and, uh, in the wake of the Flint water crisis? So we filed a federal lawsuit, um, and we had to name the Flint Community School because they are the resident district, but it's really with the Genesee Intermediate School District and the Michigan Department of Education that are responsible for what's happened within Flint. After the, in the wake of the water crisis, we were watching with the ACLU of Michigan to see what resources were coming in because as a special education attorney, I knew that there was gonna be an influx of additional needs because lead is a known neurotoxin and any level is dangerous to a child. So we were watching and when we saw what the state brought in, they brought in nutrition and they brought in some nurses. Now the nurses just got us to the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended level because Michigan was terrible in regards to our number of nurses, the worst in the nation. So we just got to a level playing field just in comparison with the nation. So it wasn't even an infusion of resources that we knew was needed within Flint. And unfortunately, we're seeing a dismantling of the school system, um, the public school system, as we see the, the lack of teachers. Um, the teachers themselves have not really received any resources in regards to it, um, accommodating their post-traumatic stra stress that has come as a wake of this crisis. Um, they were telling the children that the water was safe when, the, when it wasn't, um, and they, they suffer with that. They suffer daily on that. They have health issues as well. Um, the administration building was one of the highest lead levels once it was tested in November of 2019. Um, the most vulnerable students in Durant Terry Mott um, had over 2,000 parts per billion in their water. So that shows that there was, there was gonna be extreme needs and even those that were already struggling with disability is gonna have further exasperation of those needs. So we had to make sure that they were getting found. Um, one part of our lawsuit was um, a good result in regards to establishing the Neurodevelopmental Center of Excellence um, within uh, the Flint community. So now all children are able to be screened for a full neurodevelopmental uh, evaluation. We really built off of the work of Dr. Mona, um, infused by the registry, getting families in there to be able to see. It's not in their blood anymore. So we really need to see how it's impacting their brains as it settles into their bodies. Um, it's yet to be seen as to what the full aftermath is going to be, but we are on the ground watching closely and we'll fight to give them every service that they need and hopefully with the new administration we'll be able to do it. Wait, whoa, 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 back up, up. wait. <laughs> We're three years out from knowing about this. Yeah. Five years out from it happening, almost. And so uh, there, I remember reading and writing some of those stories saying the state was going to put more money into early childhood education and things of that nature. What you're saying, it, it's not, it, how is that going? Is that so it's fragile, right? So there was some infusion of funds in regards to early education um, more recently, uh, and but we're, it's insecure as to how long the, that money is going to last for, right? Um, that's something that we are very concerned about and we're watching closely because we don't know if it's going to be funded for a long period of time. That zero to three population, that early on population, it's vital that we make sure that we infuse resources for them. But how long is that gonna last? Um, that's the thing that is very concerning and very precarious right now. So we have to really invest on a statewide level to make sure that we're closing that achievement gap. Once the kids enter kindergarten, that has been closed because we have really infused the most vulnerable kids with all of the literacy, um, with the language needs that they have, and also with the developmental, if they're struggling with developmental disabilities, that we have really enabled them to come into kindergarten with their backpacks ready um, and able to really function at the level of their 
I don't know if you guys can see it. So Dave, um, we know what happened in Flint and that you know there's huge speculation and some evidence that these children definitely are gonna have issues moving forward. Uh, and we know what the federal government said about special education in Michigan already having huge issues and needing some intervention. Um, talk from the perspective of you know, co-founder of the Alliance for Autism. Where are 